a harsh silence descends, so that's usually because you're expecting something. Good evening. Welcome to Bergbeck. Um, welcome to the Department of uh, Organizational Psychology, and indeed welcome to the annual Alec Roger Memorial Lecture. The annual, the annual lecture uh, is the prime event in the calendar of um, the Department of Organizational Psychology here at Birkbeck. Since 1983, the Alec Roger Memorial Lecture has been held annually, and it is part funded by the T. Ritchie Roger Fund, uh, which is administered by the British Psychological Society. Alec Roger, for those of you who don't know, is the, was the first um, professor of occupational psychology uh, here at Birkbeck. Um, speakers for the Alec Roger Memorial Lecture are invited by the department and are invited on the basis of a distinguished career in academia, um, in public office or in commerce. And we are delighted um, to welcome for this year's Alec Roger Memorial Lecture Professor Andrew Pettigrew. Professor Andrew Pettigrew is a professor of strategy and organization at Said Business School at Oxford and also a senior Golding Fellow at Brasenose College. Um, please welcome Professor Pettigrew. Well, thank you, Andreas, for that introduction. And uh, now I have to try and sort of live up to it in some kind of way. And uh, the one advantage I have is that I'm an optimist. And uh, I think that. Uh, uh, I think when you're an optimist in the academic life, it's kind of useful. It, uh, when most people are risk averse, uh, it's useful to be, have this z zone of optimism about you to, take, to be a risk taker. So, but I don't think this is a risky occasion. <laughs> I mean, this is a, actually an occasion for um, uh, recognizing the life and indeed the impact of uh, Alec Roger. And uh, since that's my theme, I think one of the things we should explore and remember is, of course, he was a distinguished occupational psychologist who had a very great deal of impact uh, in his life. And this is the 29th of these lectures, and uh, Alec died in 1982 uh, after a, a long career, which, some of which I'll, I'll mention in a moment. And, and uh, in fact, for those who don't know him, just, just as, a, as a record, uh, he was uh, head of, came to notice, I suppose, in the 1930s, he was head of uh, vocational guidance at the National Institute of Industrial Psychology in the 1930s. Uh, then, during the Second World War, he was uh, chief psychologist at the Admiralty. And he was one of a relatively few psychologists who actually had quite an impact in rather practical matters uh, to do with the, the war effort in Britain. And, uh, uh, of course, that got him well connected, uh, you, you can imagine, uh, not only in the, in the sphere of public policy, but also the military. And that became a very great help to him uh, after the Second World War. And this is, of course, one of the themes I want to pursue as an ingredient to impact for a social scientist is relationships, relationships, relationships. And he was the sort of man who cultivated, made relationships. And uh, we've just heard that the, uh, the, the, the impact he had here uh, in setting up the first diploma in this area and then, of course, in, in being the head of a department. And everyone, I would say, in, in my generation, uh, I was trained in the 1960s in Britain, even though I wasn't trained in psychology. My background is in social anthropology and sociology, even though I wasn't uh, trained in psychology. Of course, I did psychology courses at university as an undergraduate, and everybody knew about Alec Roger uh, in the 1960s. And uh, so uh, I think uh, it would be interesting to, to look uh, in a sense about, uh, about his, his, some aspects of his work and, and the man, and of course, and how he would have interpreted um, you know, a title like this. I think probably. He would certainly not have used the word impact. And this is a sort of a, a current vernacular to deal with all sorts of uh, uh, things. And uh, he, m he probably would be more, more likely to have talked about applied research. Although, of course, I'm not going to define impact just in terms of applied research. But he probably would have used a phrase like that. He may also have used the term relevance. Uh, he may even have thought about you know, knowledge for what purpose, since social scientists have always been concerned about the utility of the social sciences one way or another. Now, I've read one or two of his papers, and uh, if you read them, you see that he, was, he wrote in a very matter-of-fact manner. Uh, very, it was very substantive and practical kind of writing. It was kind of almost devoid of theoretical elaboration and empirical analysis. And uh, uh, I think one very useful document, there were no, I could find no biographies or autobiographies uh, I mean, I'm sure there were essays written about it, but I couldn't find them. But I was, I was much helped by Alan Williams, who told me about the, the, the book uh, 50 Years of Occupational Psychology in Britain, which was published 
1994, and there are quite a lot of references to him in that, uh, in that book, and uh, both to the Alec Rogers and the Rogerian period, as it's known as, uh, when he was here at, uh, at Birkbeck. And i just get a couple of quotes, which uh, in a sense I'm mining here for a sense not only of the man, but in a sense how he would have responded to, uh, uh, to this kind of title and theme, which I'm going to establish in a minute. Don't worry, I'm going to get to the theme. Uh, <laughs> but ju ju just, just, uh, just, just a couple of quotes to give you a sense of the man, since we are here to recognize the man, not just to listen to me. Alec was not only a very shrewd individual in internal politics, but he had a great deal of outside influence, point I've just made. This had an enormous effect on the growth of the department and on occupational psychology as a whole during the decades 62 to 72 when he backed out. He had a charisma which attracted students in his field and, and was himself a missionary for occupational psychology rather than a, an academic. His whole outlook was practical and pragmatic with too, too little emphasis on theory and systematic research and academic development. So you saw two sides uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of Alec Rogers there. But the, the, uh, the other one very, is briefer. Rogers' maxim, which we have cited elsewhere, that occupational psychology must be technically sound, administratively feasible, and socially acceptable, governed his pragmatic, essentially a theoretic approach. Neither was there any marked emphasis on experimental or statistical skills, perhaps reflecting the low priority given to sustained and innovative research in the department under his aegis. So you can see here um, uh, a man of uh, uh, different uh, predispositions, but certainly a, a man interested in action and in practice and in influencing people. And of course he did have that chance in his life to do that, and not all of us, of course, get that chance. So. Um, when he retired uh, in 1972, I think it was, there was a period of external turbulence, I gather here, was the polite term at Birkbeck. And I, I think this is nothing unusual uh, when, when a charismatic or, and uh, potent leader moves on. Uh, the next leader has a hard time. We all saw what happened to poor old John Major when Mrs. Thatcher stepped down. You know? So this is not an unusual event uh, in life. And, uh, but of course, the, the reputation of occupational psychology and it's been relabeled, and I know there are differences between occupational psychology and organizational psychology and, and indus industrial psychology, but they're, they're kind of fine distinctions to me. But certainly, the field of uh, occupational psychology has been sustainable and has been, you know, has continued to have an impact. So, there's no doubt in my mind that Alec Roger was interested in policy and practice impacts of, of occupational psychology. I'm less sure he was uh, so uh, <coughs> much in favor of scholarly impact, which is the other side. Of, the, of this conversation I want to have with you. Basically, if I can get my conclusions in first, I'm going to argue that uh, um, we as social scientists, and I, I happen to be, well, I've worked most of my life at a business school, but uh, I still see myself as a social scientist who happens just to work in a business school. So I think we as social scientists have this uh, um, uh, opportunity uh, to ch be challenged by a double hurdle. Uh, the double hurdle is achieving work of the highest scholarly quality and having a policy and practice impact. That's my message. That's my conclusion. And that's the sort of the theme that I want to develop tonight. And I, I'm not sure that Alec would have uh, gone for both sides. I'm not sure he was a double hurdle man. But from the, the clues that you heard uh, from those comments that some of his colleagues and contemporaries made of him, he probably wasn't. But nevertheless, uh, I think he certainly would have had a view about this field. So. Uh, let's let's let me move into the into the into the into the, the talk itself and uh, what I intend to do. I think uh, the I'm going to start with the aspiration, which I've half described to you there. Then to to say something about what I see as the present reality, and I, I think I'm going to of course talk about management as a field, not psychology. Uh, though I know no, I mean I've just spent six finished six years on the council of the SRC. And my job was to worry about the quality of UK social science, so I had to try and understand what was going on in other fields. But I'm going to talk just tonight about the present reality in management as a field. Then to, to frame some of the questions about research impact, what does research impact mean? To so talk a little bit about the determinants of impact. You know, it's useful to know if somebody's aspiring to something, and of course the government's uh, re asking us to be more impactful not just in the scholarly sense, but in the policy and practice sense. It's useful to know why some people have greater impact than others. 
and how they achieve that. So we did a little bit of research uh, while I was on the ESRC Council on the determinants of impact and I'll say a little bit about that. And then finally in the end of my talk I'll, I'll move on to talking much more directly about the kinds of knowledge which perhaps are necessary in order to uh, encourage the sort of impact that I would like to see. And I'm making a distinction here between what is knowledge, which is the predominant form of knowledge that most, most social scientists try and generate. They're trying to understand patterns in the world and to identify uh, what, what those regularities are and how to explain the regularities. They're very much interested in what is. I think I'm interested in what is, but I'm also equally interested in that equally important set of knowledge, which is about how to. How, to. Um, how things happen is always much more difficult, I think, to achieve than What's, what, what, what's happening? And I've, I've been a manager myself in my career, uh, and uh, I, I know that in any situation I've ever been in, there are always many more people who, who will tell you what, what should be done. Many more of those that can tell you how to do it. Collapse of stout party, as soon as we get on to the how. So it's actually rather important. If, if that's a perpetual problem, and of course it's a problem which leads to implementation deficits all over the place, which I, I've spent the last 40 years studying. If that's the issue, we should be studying the world so that we can understand the how-to issues better. So we can better inform uh, this relationship between what is and how-to. And that's, to me, one of the big ways, one of the big opportunities we have for having impact. So I'll, I'll end on that theme, which is about uh, the kinds of knowledge and so on. But um, here we are. My question, are we making an impact? And uh, you know, here, here we are, the, the, how, the wolves howling to the moon, as you can see. You know, and uh, 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 here we are, caught up in the echo chamber of our own voice, you know, is another way of interpreting it. And, uh, and uh, is someone noticing? Um, and um, are, we're not, are, are we doing this for ourselves, or are we doing it for some bigger purpose? Um, and I suppose uh, my view is quite straightforwardly is that uh, uh, we are in the influence business, you know, and uh, uh, in, in, all, in for all of the things it means. But I think this is, this is a problematic, I think, that uh, many people recognize but are not doing very much about uh, to, uh, to deal with. And I think that's one reason why Hefke and the government has intervened at the moment uh, in, uh, in, through the, you know, the, the REF uh, to... It's, it's about cultural change, you know, it's, it's trying to deal with this problem, which I'm going to elaborate on in a moment. So, a bit of history, uh, an aspiration for us all, and uh, we all know who Thomas More was, one of the great martyrs of, uh, of course, of Catholic martyrs in British society, and uh, uh, as you know, he, uh, he, he ran, in, ran into trouble with Henry VIII, who, who was proposing that the, the, the Roman Catholic Church should lose the market in this country, which of course they promptly did lose the market. And I wonder, you know, uh, and uh, because it, it, here was another example where power won over intellect. And uh, uh, but nevertheless, his statement, the duty of the intellectuals in society is to make a difference, uh, is, is a profound one, an important one, and of course, is, and basically, what, again, what I'm pursuing tonight. We are not so endangered, of course, in pursuing this. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, uh, many people have chosen not to. I mean, there are more risks involved in getting into the kind of research I'm going to develop in a moment, the co-production of knowledge, engaged scholarship, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but um, So th there are real risks involved in this, but which I think we should be open about and talk about. And of course, develop people with the capacity early in their careers uh, to pursue research in this kind of way. And of course, the, the other thing about this uh, quotation, of course, is it contains uh, three uncomfortable words. The first one is duty. Now, how often today, in today's individualist society, do you hear people using the word duty? Very rarely. You might hear people using the word responsibility, perhaps. A softer version, much softer version. Very rarely duty. And uh, it's a rare sentiment, uh, and it's, it's an important issue, the fact that there is a... Intellectuals, no. Are you sitting next to an intellectual? <laughs> Um, this is a peculiar word in, in British society, which I'll, I'll develop in a moment, uh, uh, because I want to consider it one of the impediments, in a sense, to, to what, what I'm talking about here, uh, are the identities that we choose. And one of the choices we have is to say, I'm an intellectual, 
because if we do that in the society, you've got exactly the sort of re response that we got here. People start giggling, you know, and saying, my goodness, I couldn't possibly be one of those. You must be joking. Keep a straight face. The, the difference issue, of course, I is all about um, who benefits. And again, I think that's something that uh, we, uh, we ought to talk about, and I will do in a moment. So that's the aspiration, if you like, or well, those are elements of the aspiration. Uh, the present reality, as I see it, and I'm talking again about management research now, not, uh, not the social sciences in, in general, is, uh, is, is the management of indifference. You know, who gives a damn what kind of management research people are doing? You know? How often do you hear people proclaiming that? I mean, I've heard, I've heard a, a president after president of the Academy of Management proclaiming this uh, on a yearly basis. I've heard, of course, senior executives uh, proclaim it, and I've had a lot of contact with a number, very large number of executives in my career. My, my research, by the way, has, has been about change. Uh, I spent my whole life, first of all, in Africa, studying uh, changes in, in, in tribal societies in Uganda, and then in, in various other sort of places since then. But I spent my life uh, studying change, and uh, it's, it's, it's certainly not an issue which you, you could you say one should be indifferent about. And yet often the research that we, we do in this area is seen as being disengaged, reductionist, abstract, devoid of, uh, uh, devoid of engagement with the context, um, with, with dynamics uh, and so on. So the, the, there, is a, there is a problem in our field about the management of, in, of indifference. And uh, I think um, the, the, the reasons for this are many, and uh, we, I, I can't dwell on them, but one, of course, is the, the people's choice of theme they pursue in the research. Now, it says, I chose a good theme, change. It, it never goes away. I used to think when Mrs. Thatcher was padding around the place, you know, when, as soon as she'd gone, it all quietened down, you know. And, uh, but of course, the, the, something else happened. There was another phenomenon that occurred. So we, 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 we constantly have to engage with the issue of change. So it's a big issue to face and deal with. And one way you have some chance, you might say, of having some sort of impact if you approach the subject. I mean, I think our methods are another reason. The abstract reductionism uh, you find in so much social science, I'll talk about that in a moment, the variables paradigm, as I call it, is another reason. The failure to innovate on the Council of the SRC, I used to do analysis every year and get subject experts to do analysis every year uh, of what the research was going on in their fields. And time and time again, there was, and this was in psychology, it was in economics, it was in sociology, they'd be saying, these people are using the same old theories. You know, when they're applying for research, care, the same old theories, the same old methods. Uh, people were not being prepared to, to take the risk to challenge the conventional theories, the conventional methods that most people were using. So this is a further issue. And uh, of course, the other thing is about the risk uh, of uh, engaged scholarship itself. So there is a... There is, a, uh, there is an issue here, there is a problem here, and, uh, and I think if, if you start looking at this on, just on the scholarly side for a moment, uh, uh, you know, and one, one way of, of course of looking at uh, about, uh, scholarly impact is to look at bibliometrics. You can see here that, um, um, I don't need to read them out to you, what the sobering facts are. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know whether anyone is surprised by these numbers, uh, and uh, uh, whether we should be concerned about it. But, Basically, most academics are writing for themselves, you know, and, uh, uh, and let's not sort of dress it up in, in any other kind of way. So the, uh, uh, and, and of course, and, and of course the, the critique of this is often, well, citation analysis is, uh, yeah, is, is, um, is spurious, it's difficult, you can't, there are all sorts of buts, of course, and some of the buts I've, I've, I've mentioned here, and, uh, um, yeah, but I think the final but, which is where I really want to go, is I think citation analysis is meaningful or can be meaningful. I mean, when I was one of the previous, one of the managerial jobs, I was director of research at the Warwick Business School, which is a very successful school for many, many years, still is. I think at the time I was there, it was sort of maybe number three or four in the UK. And the, there were 25 professors in the department when they, when they appointed me. I thought, well, if I think of what I'll do is I'll, I'll do some citation counts of the worthy professors in the department. You know? So I got one of my PhD students to do a, just, just for one year, just to see, uh, was there a meaningful distribution here across the worthy professors who were in, in the top the four, four departments in the country? And the range went from 160 citations. The next one was about 60. There was a cluster around 30 or 40, and a bigger cluster around the 20s. And five of the worthy professors had no citations at all in that year. You know, so, I mean, in that sense, 
that distribution is real, you know. You, you may debate about it, and of course I should have done it for several years, but there wasn't time. I was just curious, just did it out of curiosity, to see what the, the state of play was in that particular department at that particular point in time. So the, uh, I wouldn't discount the, the, um, the, the whole issue about, um, uh, about, uh, about citations as a measure or metric uh, of, of, of impact on the scholarly dimension. We haven't got to the policy and practice dimension yet. So what about uh, getting a bit closer to home? Uh, what part are our identities playing in this narrative? Back to basics. Who are, who are we? What do we value in our practice? Uh, what do we give emphasis to? Where are we, where, which areas are we crowding into? And I think these are some of the identities, of course, which uh, lie around, uh, around us and the, uh, the um, I suppose the, the most familiar, the teacher learning educator course is, is uh, you know, at Oxford, you know, the, where I am at the moment. Uh, I mean, this, this was always the, 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 the highest value contribution in, in the college was your skills, your commitment to uh, tutorial teaching and, uh, and the great of course, value attached to undergraduates uh, as, a, as, a, as a student body. So, uh, and of course, this has been declining everywhere. Uh, people's attachment to the importance of teaching and learning education as part of the uh, uh, professional identity. And of course, that's another story. Uh, and uh, we'll, um, you know, not, uh, not what I want to pursue today. The researcher um, identity, of course, has risen dramatically as the first identity has, has declined. And uh, here, the, the, the term researcher to me, and I've, you know, run big research centers, I've employed lots of researchers, I've been a researcher all my life. Research to me denotes a sense of task orientation to a field, to a field of research, of course. Uh, the implications is of scholarly depth, not width. I do research, I publish research papers, I only know what I research, I only teach what I research. This is the corollary uh, of, that goes with this identity when you see it at its most extreme. Uh, so there, there's a sense of uh, task orientation and instrumentality here, which is certainly different from what I'm going to go on and define uh, in terms of the scholarly role. The scholarly role I would see as, um, uh, of course, not people's normal definition of a scholar would be uh, someone who is uh, a learned person in a particular field of scholarship. The emphasis here is... Uh, uh, wide-ranging appreciation of a field. So we've gone from depth to width. And of course, a, an interest in communicating, uh, in educating, often, often goes with this scholarly definition, certainly as it's been practiced at Oxford. And uh, so width rather than depth is the implication here, although depth may exist as well. Uh, but, but for the scholar, the pride is excellence in the width of scholarship and communicating, the, communicating that scholarship uh, to other people. Now, I don't see a huge number of scholars uh, in my field in that sense. I see many, many more people who are researchers in the sense in which I defined it than scholars. If we moved on to, to the intellectual, of course, uh, uh, the one we were all sniggering at a, moment, a few moments ago, th of course, this is, a, this is a highly culturally laden term. Um, you know, as I said, is the person sitting next to you an intellectual? Are you an intellectual? Uh, would you run a mile from this label? Stefan Collini has written a, a marvelous book on, uh, uh, on, the, uh, on, on British intellectuals uh, called Absent Minds. And he argues there is a, a long British tradition of denial of this term. And uh, unlike the French, the Poles, the Austrians, we don't have intellectuals. Intellectuals begin at Calais. You know, and, uh, uh, so, so, uh, so there is a problem in our society about the attachment to this term. And yet, it, to me, it's a, it can be a, a potent, and of course, it's, it's full of irony. You know, the, all the irony that goes with it. You know, the eggheads, boffins, know-alls, telly-dons, you know, all this, uh, all this kind of stuff, you know, which is a familiar association with the term, uh, which is highly pro pro problematic. Collini provides a more or less precise definition of an intellectual as a cultural role. I think it's quite good. It probably would go too far uh, for many people. In fact, the definition, as you can see, would take us into the, 
the, the, the, the, uh, the fifth category of the public intellectual. But let me read it out to you. An intellectual is someone who's, who, first attempt, who attains, first attains a level of creative, analytical, and scholarly achievement, and then uses available um, media channels to engage with broader concerns of wider publics, then becomes a recognized authority, or at least a recognized figure and a voice. So this is, this is moving very much uh, into, the, uh, into the public intellectual. And of course, uh, there are very few public intellectuals in management. I mean, there, there are in other fields, of course, Paul Krugman, a famous economist, Nobel Prize winner, very much a public intellectual. Anthony Giddens uh, would, would see himself and has been treated like that in the society. But, but in our field, there are very few public intellectuals. The only one I could think of would be somebody like Michael Porter uh, at the, the Harvard Business School. But we tend to have uh, gurus, you know, uh, rather, than, uh, rather than public intellectuals. And I, I think this is, again, another problematic. No, no association, nobody prepared to take the step to commit themselves, uh, or not enough of us prepared to take the step to commit ourselves to that kind of identity. So I think this is taking the argument right down to who we are and what we do, how we spend our time what's important to us, what we value, but these choices are critical. And I suppose what I'm saying is that now some people, these, are not, these terms are not mutually exclusive, of course. Some people can uh, play alternative uh, identities uh, all, you know, all the time. Uh, but, nevertheless, but I think the, the, there's clearly a, the distribution here, I think, is not helpful uh, to, um, uh, to the argument I'm making about the need for uh, scholarly impact. So let me try and um, frame the question a little bit more. So what are we talking about here? Well, we're, um, how am I framing this term? Well, I'm, I'm starting off by saying, well, there's a double hurdle here, that um, we're in the business of dualities. It's not you either have a scholarly impact or you have a policy or practice impact. The dichotomy is a duality. Uh, we should be aspiring to have, be having an impact in both dimensions. And that's, that's, that's what it's all about. Dissemination. Um, uh, is not impact, and I think this is. Uh, I think th often the issue of impact to me is trivialised in, in a dissemination issue. You know, if only I could shoot the breeze like President Obama. You know, uh, uh, or if, if only I could write like Graham Greene. You know, somebody would have noticed me by now. You know, but uh, I can't, of course. You know, so it, it's it's portrayed. Uh, I think trivialised as a dissemination dissemination issue. I don't think that means to say that the, the ability to communicate is of no consequence. It clearly is of great consequence. But it's not right to me right to, to boil it down just to a dissemination issue. It's much more, much more complex than that. Because the, the ESRC and the HEFKI have got well into this issue about, uh, about assessing impact. And you've seen in the, I don't know if MD here is responsible for the REF submission in, the, uh, in, the, in your department. But you can see they've gone for qualitative assessment, certainly on the policy and practice side, asking us to produce narratives. And I think these narratives can be quite convincing uh, if, you, uh, uh, if you write them in the right sort of fashion. The cultural change objective, I mean, I think this is what it's all about. The, the, this is the government using incentives and disincentives to say, OK, now, you lot shifts the fo shift the focus from the intermediate good of publishing and start recognizing the final good. The final good is not publishing. Publishing is the necessary stepping stone. The final good is somebody noticing, either on the scholarly side or on the policy of practice. That's what this is what this is what the game is all about. And I think putting it in as stark a term as that is is a very good way, I think, of making the argument. Determinants. I'm going to I'll pass over that quickly because I want to I want to deal with that in, in its own terms in a moment. Although it's cr it's crucial to know. Why is it that some people seem to have greater policy and practice impact than others? It's a useful question to have an answer, you know, answer, some answers to. The co-production hypothesis. Now, this is, this is a, a term which actually has come from engineering. I remember foolishly standing up and giving a talk to some technologists in a very similar sort of area. And when I mentioned the term co-production of knowledge, they just said, Andrew, for goodness sake, we've been doing this for 50 years. You know, we always co-produce knowledge. We get out there, we work with somebody in industry, uh, we de define the, pro the problem together, we work on the conceptual framework for the work, we, we, we decide what sort of data we get, we collect the data together, we crunch the numbers together, and we write it up. The co-production of knowledge is everyday practice uh, in engineering. But it's not become everyday practice in our field. I mean, if it, they, 
You know, thank goodness we've moved away from the era of smash and grab research. Remember by social scientists? Remember that one? You, you rush up to some organization or other, throw a brick through the window, grab the data, disappear off in a cloud of smoke, take it back to your office in splendid isolation, crunch it all up, uh, and then write it up in some article. And the, the poor folk back in the organization, you know, feel as if they've been ravished, you know. They, now that, that, kind of smash and, that kind of smash and grab research, thankfully, uh, people have learned that doesn't work. And it ca creates consequences for other people, which are very negative. So that kind of behavior is, is, is declining. But maybe we, we, we haven't yet uh, got onto the, enough onto the co-production proposition, which of course, and here this is still a hypothesis, the, that in fact that this, this co-production knowledge will lead uh, to uh, greater impact. It's, it's still a hypothesis. So, what is research impact? Well, as you, can, as you can see, I've been arguing it has to be dealt as, with as a duality. Um, uh, we also, rec in recognizing this duality, we know that, uh, um, that the, the probability, and this is a probabilistic exercise, like all research, you know, nothing is guaranteed. It's a probabilistic exercise. We know that there are certain contexts and certain times um, uh, when uh, ideas are going to be better received than others. You know, there are receptive and non-receptive contexts for ideas. And the, you look at the history of the social production of knowledge in all the, social, all the sciences, never just mind just the social sciences, you can see that very clearly. Ideas have come out which have been culturally rejected. It says knowledge, <laughs> even with evidence, culturally rejected at certain points of time because people were not prepared to take it on. So the receipt of ideas is, is culturally uh, and contextually very, very important. And of course, this is the reason why you get lagged effects in, in, the, in the one reason why the Hefke and the Research Excellence Framework have allowed us to go back to 1993 in terms of starting with our propositions about having impact. We know there's always a lag. There are attribution problems and also lagged problems. So the, these, these are all complex issues. The in, but they're important to recognize. The instrumental impact, I suppose, is you would say would be a social scientist claiming that new, new legislation has come forward in our society uh, as a result of uh, the work we've done. And there are examples of that. Uh, new policies have arisen in certain, in certain policy areas or certain policy domains. Again, there's, pl there's plenty of evidence of that in, in of social scientists having an impact in that kind of way. Conceptual impact, slightly more subtle. It's not so instrumental, maybe not so concrete, but I think probably more pervasive. And I think the, this is where social scientists are, um, in a sense, using their ideas, their conceptual frameworks, their knowledge to reframe a problem. So instead of a problem being defined like this, it's defined like that. In exposing a bigger space, you expose more uh, policy options. And in exposing po po more policy options, you may also be exposing uh, different pathways of implementation. So I think that's a terrain where social scientists, one could say very positively, have made a big, big impact. So I think this distinction between instrumental and in that sense of conceptual impact is, is a useful one to, to make. And it's certainly, uh, in the, uh, you can see many examples uh, of this uh, in, uh, in, the, in, in social science work in, the, in this country. Capacity building and impact, I suppose we're, we're talking here about building the capacity in social science departments uh, for engagement and co-production, which is still at its infancy. One of the things I tried to do when I was at the ESRC and failed was to take this impact work into the, doc into the doctoral program and require, and the ESRC can do this, require uh, doctoral programs legitimated by the ESRC to deal with issues of the co-production of knowledge and what is called engaged scholarship, to make sure that everybody knew about it. They didn't need to practice it, but they were aware of it. Because they probably, you know, their elders and betters hadn't done this, so they weren't going to persuade them to do it, you know. So if you have to get at the younger generation, of course, uh, uh, in these sort of matters. So I think that, that's very important. The cultural change impact, is, is to me, is all about desire, willingness, uh, to, 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 to engage uh, in this kind of work. And uh, the enduring connectivity issue is about um, the, the power of pursuing big research problems over long periods of time where you, where you, whether you build uh, very, very uh, strong relationships with user communities. Now, I'll mention that in a moment when we talk about determinants. So that's what I mean by research uh, impact. In terms of determinants, uh, um, the, I suppose the easy answer um, to this question is to say it's about relationships, relationships, relationships. 
that, uh, um, the, that the complex answer is to say, well, the people have Im who have, hit, have impact, they build intellectual capital, uh, they build social capital, relationships, networks, and of course, eventually, if they're fortunate, they have reputational capital. So the, the, and that, of course, doesn't happen overnight. We all know that you don't construct that overnight. Uh, and that's why, of course, the issue about impact, some people, it's, it's an easier playing field for, su for some people than others. But nevertheless, I think the issue in the construction of scholarly careers and in the, in the pattern of, of work that people get involved with, to m keep an eye on all the time these three capitals, the intellectual capital, we all understand that, uh, social capital, some people naturally do that, others have to be talked into it, cajoled into it, uh, uh, and of course reputational capital is, is a probabilistic activity anyway. But nevertheless, the, uh, these things are all, are all very important and because they're, they're difficult to, to, to build. The, I suppose the, the other key thing which I've mentioned is uh, the importance of context and the process of knowledge production and the content of ideas, and matching somehow the, uh, I mean, it, one of the things we know about policy arenas is that the you know, there's a kind of rise and fall of you know of policy issues, and uh, it's tough luck. You know, uh, you know if if your if your big area of research is now at the bottom of the uh, bottom of the cycle, maybe you ought to find another area to do your research in. You know, uh, but so some people again get lucky. Others, of course, others create markets um, you know, in in the academic world. I mean, I, I'm a collector. I'm a collector of antiques actually, and uh, I remember in the 60s. Uh, um, watching a, a very famous book uh, come out on Victorian paintings in the 60s. And people weren't interested, you know, pre-Raphaelites, weren't the slightest bit interested in, in pre-Raphaelites. All of a sudden when, uh, when uh, uh, Mr. Maas, uh, 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 Rupert's dad, Jeremy Maas, so you've seen him on the Antiques Roadshow, when he, when, he, when he produced his book on a Victorian painting, he created a market and people started to take interest. So I think we, we can do that as well. I mean, and you, you can see academics doing that, creating a market, uh, not only in terms of their own scholarly theme, but in terms of the, its connections with the policy world. But again, that takes will and skill to do that. You know, it's, it won't just happen. So obviously, you know, the perceived, one would assume the perceived originality and timing of the ideas is going to be important. The co-production of knowledge, I've mentioned that. I think personal institutional branding is also a contributor. Uh, you know, your place in the marketplace of ideas uh, is, uh, is not just a product of an individual project. It's the, it's the result of cumulative effort over quite long periods of time, the intellectual capital, if you like. And, uh, and, I mean, how, uh, Michael Porter has a huge brand as, a, as an academic, but he happens to be working at the Harvard Business School, which is not a bad place to work, you know, if you're, if you're in this. So, so there's no doubt about it that personal institutional branding uh, does also make a difference. And, the, of course, the, the other thing which is crucial, which I've been mentioning all the time, is, is this the, the importance of social capital. And uh, um, some people do this very, very deliberately to underpin their work. Now, I mean, two of, the, two of the, the case studies of research centers we looked at in this ESRC work were in London, actually. Uh, I wouldn't say they were off the end of the distribution, but they were certainly, they had done extraordinarily well. One is the Center for Economic Performance at London School of Economics, and the other one was the Institute of Fis Fiscal Studies, IFS, which, of course, is the University College London, also has a, uh, you know, a strong um, ES ESRC connection. Uh, if you look at the, for, for, first of all, these, these two bodies have been pursuing big themes with big teams for a long period of time. Their place in the market is recognized. They've been tested out and they've delivered cycles of work in the area which are well connectable to policy issues. Again, I think you have a great advantage. I mean, in terms of relationship, you're sitting in London here. My goodness, if you can't do it, they all can do it. You're sitting in London, you know. <laughs> half a mile away from you know, all these people, you know, all the chattering classes and politicians and civil servants and so on. So they've had the enormous advantage of location. They've done high quality work, they've got strong networks of relationships in those worlds, and, they, and they've got strong networks of relationships with the media, as it's seen particularly with the IFS. You can see the huge impact that all that's having on their sustainability of their effort and of their progressively their impact both on the scholarly side and the policy side. Now, as an individual, you can't recreate that overnight, but certainly uh, it has been known for people to build such centers like that and to pursue them. 
having purposeful user engagement, knowledge exchange strategy, again, very, very important. And, uh, uh, well, the portfolios of sustained research, again, very, very important. And the final thing I'm mentioning here uh, is um, the, the, the terrific role of uh, knowledge intermediaries and brokers as translators, amplifiers, and influencers. One of the things when I went back looking at Alec Rogers, uh, and uh, uh, there, was, there were two institutional bodies in psychology at that time. One was the National Institute of Industrial Psychology. I can't remember what the other one was called now, but these, these, were, these were crucial intermediary bodies that psychologists at that time could work through and connect with policymakers. And I don't know what's happened to them, but certainly at the time that Alec Rogers was running around and, and uh, contributing, uh, those Im intermediaries uh, and, and knowledge brokers were very important to translate, to amplify, and to influence. I, I mean, I work very closely with McKinsey uh, and um, I chair their academic sounding board for one of the 25% of their practice. And I've got strong relationships with McKinsey. And there's no question about it, they amplify the research I do and my colleagues do in all kinds of very useful ways. So we shouldn't underestimate the power of intermediaries, I think, in this process. So um, I want to switch now to the, the final bit of my talk, which is to, is, which is to, to, uh, uh, is to say some, some, con con some concluding observations. And um, I'm he here I'm going to get a bit closer uh, to home really, and, and make some more personal observations about the social production of knowledge, which, which bears on the impact question, which I've been talking about in a fairly generic sort of way. And uh, I think the, can the analytical, analytical approach we take uh, and the research we, 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 we conduct and the forms of knowledge we generate make a difference for our potential for impact? This is the question I'm going to ask. It's, it's a more focused question about research methodology, about orientation, and it's also a question about forms of knowledge uh, that I think uh, we need to, uh, to generate. So before I get into that, I suppose this slide is, is about saying, well, of course, we're often trying to influence leaders. Uh, you know, we're, we're often in the business of trying to influence leaders some, some might be in the private sector, some might be in the public sector, some might be in the political arena. And I think I just wanted to, to emphasize the, um, uh, the, uh, the tremendous influence that contextual, as I call them, contextual realities and temporal realities have on leaders. And uh, uh, the most obvious way you'd, you'd notice it, was, of course, would be the, the changing economic and political context that leaders face and the changing rules of the game that are occasioned by those contextual changes. We saw this very, 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 in fact, I studied ICI right through the 1980s, uh, after the, when, when Thatcher appeared, and the, the, the Thatcherist uh, uh, political ideology and economic policies materialized, helped a little bit by the 1981 uh, recession. But all this was a complete change, contextual change. And, it, it, and I remember somebody, a senior manager saying, uh, and I said to me, uh, you know, this woman's come along and opened up the window for change. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, so I think some people went too far, as we now know, we can, we can now see, but uh, you can't deny contextual realities are, are crucial uh, for people in positions of influence, and for the rest of us, actually, uh, for most of the time. The sectoral mac mac market, market context we're, we're in, we, what we've seen recently, the delegitimization of banking. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, as a consequence of the events of the last uh, uh, several years. Again, if you're in that sector or relate, sector related to it, you can't ignore that. You don't come in on Monday morning and say that's never happened, you know. That's a contextual reality, you know. Uh, the intra-organisational context, we're getting down now to the, the local politics and, and culture and priorities of a particular department. Of course, we're also f all the time faced with the performance realities. Is this a failing department? Is this a failing business? Is this a failing university? Again, you can't ignore that when you get into office at nine o'clock on the Monday morning. So we all know that these contextual realities are a crucial feature for people in positions of power. And the same thing uh, I would I'll put on the temporal side, which is the other thing that uh, I want to emphasize here in terms of the kind of research that we do. One of the most important temporal realities for a leader is the heavy hand of the past. When you, when you arrive in a new job, um, 
uh, you can't ignore the fact that there's a legacy there. You know, there was somebody there before you. You know, <laughs> and there's all sorts of stuff lying around. Skeletons in the cupboard is the familiar term people use. You know, that, that most of us, if you're ever in an executive position, you, you have to engage with whatever legacy is there. Uh, you have to engage with the life cycle of the sector or the organisation, or of course your own life cycle as a leader, because leaders go through life cycles. So there's, there's, a, the, the, there's a, s a similar sort of uh, pressure here uh, on a set of dynamics. So I suppose the, what, I, what I'm trying to, is, this is a build up to saying, look, if we're going to have more, more impact as social scientists, if these things are so important, why don't, we engage, why don't we do research which engages more with the contextual reality of the phenomenon we're studying? And study it over time, you know? Social scientists have no time for time, you know? You know it complicates life, you know? It means the research project takes longer, you know? All, that, all sorts of unpleasant things, you know? So, um, and of course, all this is about the, um, and I'm, I'm going to be bounce through this very quickly, all this is about the, uh, the problematics that, that modernist science has left with us. And I won't dwell on this uh, because I think it's, this is all familiar stuff to you, but just to mention the importance uh, of, of the phenomenon. And I'm, I'm only doing this to, in order to, um, uh, to make this point, that uh, it's not so much with what the modernist tradition has done because the, the, the scientific benefits of, of modernism, you know, are huge, you know, uh, throughout the 18th, the 19th, and 20th, and 21st century, well, certainly for the, f the first three of those centuries. Uh, it, the issue I'm raising is, what is this modernist tradition, uh, uh, what's, what's, what's it left out? And I think the, the, one of the quickest ways into dealing with this is to, is to, um, is to mention the, the work of Andrew Abbott. Andrew Abbott is a Chicago professor of sociology, uh, his most recent book, actually, uh, is called Time Matters, which was published by University of Chicago Press in 2001. And this is, I mean, I think the variables paradigm has not been exhausted, unfortunately. But this is, he's a great critique of it. And what, what's, what does he mean by the variables paradigm? Well, he, well, it's implied in this statement here, of course. He's talking about the abstractionism and reductionism of the variables paradigm. That we can boil something down. We can boil Andrew Pettigrew down to some sort of position on a, an, on a scale between extroversion and introversion. You know, that's all we need to know about Andrew Pettigrew. You know? uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's reductionism, it's abstractionism of an extreme form. And of course, it's, it's usually wrapped up in a, oh yes, we, have a, we need a dependent variable. Uh, we need uh, usually three or four independent variables, and if you're lucky, there's some moderating variables in between, you know. And the, mo the world moves from left to right, you know. You know, it just goes from there. This causes that through these intermediate effects. Uh, this is the variables paradigm. And of course, it's so embedded, um, it, and it, it, prevent it presents a sort of decontextualized and detemporalized view of the world. And of course, it's, it's the predominant mode, and it's far from exhausted, you know. It's, this is alive and well everywhere. And most social scientists actually are quite happy with this, you know. It, it works for them, it produces good knowledge, in inverted commas, and they get it published in the right places, and thank you very much and good night, you know. But I think the, <laughs> the issue for me is what is this leaving out, you know, that's, that's my point. Not that we should abandon all this, of course, uh, that's uh, an impossible. Uh, so it's, we, we, we should move, um, uh, again, a set of dualities. Search for general truths, by all means. You can't get up as a, in the morning as a social scientist and uh, think, well, there are no patterns out there. You know, if, you, if that was your view of life, you, you, you'd be wasting your life. You, you have to assume there are general patterns, if not general truths out there. That's fine, but let's look at the variation of those, those truths against notions of temporality and spatial context. Let's combine the abstractionism and reduction of the variable paradigm and a new concern for action, dynamics, context, and complexity. Get closer to the phenomenon that one is studying and temper the deductive ambition by allowing for uh, uh, inductive thinking and research, research practice. So that's the, this is my view. And I, I, th I suppose in conclusion, um, I, I should finish now. I'm nearly up to my 60 minutes, but I haven't quite got there. But I think I should finish now to give you a break. I sp what, I, what, I, what I'm saying here is that the, the, other, the other side of all this argument is about the social production of knowledge and the kind of knowledge we produce. And it's it, the possibility of that form of knowledge engaging with 
uh, people who one might want to influence out there, whoever they happen to be. And I'm suggesting that a more contextualist and dynamic view of knowing will create additional conditions for this possibility of scholarly and policy and practice impact. And I suppose my final point uh, is, is about the, 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 again, the complementary benefits of generating knowledge which understand us, allows us to understand what is, what are the patterns, what are the regularities out there, but combining that what is knowledge with the crucial requirement uh, to generate how-to knowledge. And I've developed a lot of that in my life, and it, it's all about studying things over long periods of time uh, so that you can begin to see how situations were created, how were they dissolved, how were they mobilized, how were they dis destroyed, you know. How to, and allowing one therefore to begin to sort of theorize about how to do things and not just about what things to do. And that I think is the other key thing that I would say to uh, younger social scientists today by way of encouragement. Let's, let's learn a little bit more about how to and not concentrate so much just on what is. Well, I don't know what Alec Rogers would have felt about all this, but uh, if, he, if he's listening up there, you know, and uh, uh, I'm thinking, my goodness, I wouldn't have said it like that. Uh, but at least I hope he's listening up there. And I hope, I hope again, uh, in, this, in this occasion, uh, we've had another opportunity to think about Alec Rogers, because that's what matters. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Those of you who've been attended the last 28 of these will know <laughs> that uh, traditionally the Alec Roger does not have questions at the end of it. Um, however, we do have a reception outside and Andrew will be there and if there are burning uh, questions, I'm sure he'll uh, uh, do his best to, uh, to answer those. Uh, Andrew talked earlier about duty, and it's my duty to propose our uh, thanks to him, but I think uh, I, it goes beyond duty to say thank you very much. That was extremely interesting, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.